the little people of science. They're the heroes today. We're talking to Eric Sherry next. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Yes. And it's science today here at Book Circle Online. Yes, Dickie James and science. I like science. Science is good. I used to be a nurse a long time ago. My other career is a long time ago. I believe science is very important. It's in the news a lot these days, too. <laughs> so other ways. Hi, welcome to Book Circle Online. I'm James Lodge, your host. And she and he, they all blinded me with science. Thank you, Thomas Dolby. I love that. Okay, my guest today wrote a really fascinating book that I want you guys to all get. If, you, if you're a history fan, if you're a science fan, if you just want to know what's going on in the world, you should read this book. It's called A, Seven, a Tale of Seven Scientists and the New Philosophy of Science. Um, it's a little bit of history. It's a lot of science, a little bit of philosophy. Some things I'm sure people think are controversial in some ways. I, found, I just found it a very, very interesting read. I like the way it's set up. I love it. You should go out there and get it. My guest is Dr. Eric Sherry. How are you, sir? Good. Hi. Welcome. How are you? you have that great gray hair. I'm, I get it right here. I'm hoping, I'm hoping the top turns that well, way at some you. point. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes, welcome. So you guys can follow us on iTunes and YouTube under Book Circle Online. We actually have a, a Twitter page, and it's Book Circle On. Mm -hmm. And you can follow me at James Law Jr. All over the universe. Just type my name in, and I will show up. Not at your house, but I will show up you know, on the Internet. And where can they find you on social media? Out there. I, a couple of websites. Yes. Uh, ericsherry.com, basically. Very good. Well, ericsherry.com. That's where you should go. Right. And, that's, and for you guys who are listening, that's Sherry as an S-C-E-R-R-I. Just make sure. We have people who listen to the show. That's right. Make sure we get that out there. Uh, okay, so you, this book, very, very good book. Thank you. Um, one of the things I was telling you kind of off camera, I'm going to reiterate here on camera, that it's, you can tell your love of history. Mm -hmm. I know you like history, sure. and so do I. So the book is really set, it's a, it's a really easy read, folks. So anybody out there who's thinking, oh my God, science, get that out the, out the door. It's a nice read. You talk about, I like the way each chapter is set up. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about these seven scientists who, I want to make sure I say their names, because they're important today, mm -hmm. and always. Edmund Stoner, John Nicholson, Richard Abegg, 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 yeah. Abegg yeah. Uh, Charles Berry, John D. Mainsmith mm -hmm. and uh, Charles Genet, right? Because ah. he's French, mm -hmm. right? Make sure I say it correctly. Um, and you talk about each of them a little bit, what they, what they who they are, yeah. and then what their what their what their contributions were, and and also you talk about some of the things they were actually trying to disprove. Mm -hmm. um, and you and you tie it with your with you because it's also your book, so it's, it's from you, mm -hmm. and you're talking too. How how easy or hard? Was it to write this book, this type of book? Well, uh, it was kind of easy because it's my passion. It was hard because I had to do the really hard work of chasing up every detail yes. and, and, and making sure it's consistent and, and so on. But it was fun. I mean, I love doing it. Yeah. I've, I've done many books now. And uh, yes, you've done you've done over what ten, fifteen? I've got about I've got ten books. And wow, that's good. An eleventh one in the press. But this one was kind of special. This is a new departure for me. Um, as you mentioned, it's seven scientists. I call them the little people. The little people, yes. Let me tell you more about the little people. Yes, please. The little people are the unsung heroes. They're the ones who, have, even scientists have barely heard of these guys. Wow. Uh, they're the missing links. They show us that science is not about just the geniuses. You know, the public perception of science is that it's created by these people with individ outstanding individual abilities and that, that results in a distorted image of what science is. It, it, it produces an image of science as an elitist activity practiced by the high priests, the Einsteins, <laughs> yes. the, the Richard Feynmans. Yeah. But actually, there are so many more people who are contributing. And that's why I got this book, because it's not, because again, we're fed whatever, we're, you know, whatever history tells, whatever we're told, right? Whatever right. whatever's written. Yeah. And whatever celebrating, you said you get a good point about how these certain people—they're the ones that are talked about. Yeah. But there's like there are a lot of folks out there who are all in this field, right. and they were all working, and they were all right. doing things. Right. Why do you think they, some of these people are just not? Well, why it, these seven people weren't like you know told talking about? It's the cult of genius. Uh, it's the cult of the personality, and that's partly responsible. You know, it, it feeds, in a way, it uh, motivates scientists to want to be the best. Mm -hmm. but, but that leads to a distorted picture. I mean, yeah. th there's a fabric of science made up of, in fact, I, I mean, I go further in the book. I claim that science is, is one organic whole. It's an entity. It's a living entity, mm -hmm. a little bit like 
You, you heard of the Gaia hypothesis mm -hmm. by James Lovelock? Yeah. He's, he claims the Earth is a living organism. Yes. I'm saying science is a living mm -hmm. organism. I believe it. I totally believe it. You've got all these competing individuals. Mm -hmm. Of course, competition is good. I'm not trying to deny competition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. seen from afar, it's a bit yeah. like a beehive where all the bees mm -hmm. are collectively working for the good of the hive. Yeah. So all these priority disputes that scientists engage in, you know, they matter to the scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, competition leads them to better things. Okay, yeah. But science as a whole sort of um, laughs at this masquerade <laughs> of the personality <laughs> cult and the competition yeah. because science marches on regardless. In fact, it benefits yes. from that competition. You yeah, know? because yeah, I'm thinking science doesn't care if you're popular or not. I exactly. mean, it's, it's all being, it's all with the work that you do, the energy you put into it is right. what science is. And, in, and it's the collective result of yeah. all these people contributing. So even if you're the loudest, or wear the brightest clothes in science, you know, so to speak, so to speak, it doesn't really matter in the long run. You might, you might get noticed more. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. But yeah. it's like, but it doesn't really mean anything to right. actual science. Exactly. That, that makes sense to me. That's what, that's what makes sense to me. Um, when you mentioned, so you mentioned, you said you, so you use the little people because I love that because it's, it's such a nice, uh, it's a. There's a nice way of saying these are folks who they're not really little people. It's, like, it's just right. kind of a, a use of a word, a term that we use sometimes yeah. Yeah. for the folks who don't get recognition. Sure. They get people who step their way. You say, Except on little people. Yeah. I like that term. And was there any reservation using that term at all, or was that something you were like, I um, need to use this? Term? I use it uh, tongue in cheek. I'm saying that the little people are really just as big as the big people. Yes, mm -hmm. that's, that's, what, that's what I'm implying. Here. And this book really does. I mean, it does. T I mean, that's that's the whole feeling on that. You are author, you're a historian, philosopher of chemistry at UCLA. That's right. Right. That's you, you are a smart person. <laughs> I've been around smart people. I love that. <laughs> um, so and the what and this is why I bring that up is because. Science gets this kind of like people just like fall asleep and they hear the word science, right? Except for Neil deGrasse Tyson now selling as a science hunk. All of a sudden sure. he's the science guy, sure. so to speak, and Bill Nye, of course, too. But, yeah. um, but science is something that is actually exciting. Sure. Why aren't we more excited about it? You think, and just in your opinion? Uh, partly because it's seen as an elitist activity. So uh, you're here to break it down. For I'm trying. Right? I'm really tr doing my best yeah. to try and break down that. And and these days, even in the political sphere, it's become so important. Yes. I mean. Scientists are classed as elitists, and therefore there's more likelihood of denying science, perhaps, um, which is unfortunately happening right, how, left, right, and center. How do you feel about that? How can, how can people well, deny certain things? It's like, it's science. I how could, do you deny stuff? I could go on at great length on that <laughs> subject, and I'm sure we will as we get into this. Yeah, yes, we'll get into this. I just, I just, it just, it just, because I have, I have you in front of me, so like, this is crazy, it's crazy to me, I'm like, how people, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you're from Malta originally, correct? From Malta. And you were raised in England. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 you're a person, you seems like, if I was doing research on you, you're a challenger. But I see now as I'm talking to you, it's in the context of breaking it all down so that there's, there's, everyone's on the same kind of level in hmm. science. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of the, I kind of get from you. Uh -huh. So that we're all, we're all doing stuff. Some people, yeah, some people are yeah. a little smarter yeah. than others. Some people have expertise in certain things. Right. But seemingly it's, you, you don't just take everything, take everything for face value. You want to know deeper. Is that right. correct? That's Absolutely. why the book is Absolutely. part of that. Yeah. That's it. I, I'm interested in philosophy. I'm interested in, in getting in the deeper picture of this. I'm interested in saying that it, uh, science, contrary to the public image it generally has, is actually a very humble activity, just like any other activity. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just trying things out. We're stumbling around in the dark. You know, the, the rational, the powerful rational mind, the super intellect, I is a distortion of what's really going on. And that's why the little people are actually contributing because they stumble around just as much as the heroes stumble around mm -hmm. and the result of the stumbling the serendipity the failed attempts somehow all conspires together to give us what we have as science That's so true, it, it, yeah. it really is just a gradual evolutionary development it's not it's not by design it's not planned out in advance it doesn't have that sort of uni unidirectional uh, path yeah. that one usually assumes about science mm -hmm. it's 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 an evolution just like so much else in life is. That makes sense to me, because now, now you say that, I'm thinking about that, and as I read this book, I'm thinking, like, you're right, it's, it's more uh, like a certain certain professions, there is like a line or something, like, but science could go any direction, any anywhere, could, any time, it doesn't really... And it helps that it's like that, yeah. because if something comes along that is unexpected, you have to change direction, you have to follow that. Yeah. You, you cannot have expectations. And at the end of the day, nature decides. We ask the questions, and we get the answer back from nature. And, and if it fits, good. If it doesn't, you change direction. It has to be open. It has to be a constant dialogue yeah. with, with nature. Wow. 
That's very interesting. I, I never really thought of it that way. That's very, that's very interesting. So you, so basically, you have to always be present and open to the universe as you're in science. Right. Right. That's, that's there's, right. there's no dogmas. There's yeah. no rules in advance. There's you, it, it's precisely the opposite of, you yeah. know, a system of beliefs which is well defined in advance. And that's yeah. why sometimes there's clashes between, let's say, religion and science, because, yes. you know, in this respect, the two systems are somehow opposed. You know, oh yes, political systems, yes. religious systems, sometimes have a set of dogmas that they want yeah. to preserve, or the constitution, say. Yeah. Know, a lot of people want to preserve it as it is. Mm -hmm. That's the antithesis, antithesis yes. of what science is, which is that there is no dogma. Right. We're, up, we're revising things continually. We go, yes. we go with the flow. We go with what. Yeah. What comes along next? So scientists aren't these like uptight people. It's like it's basically the politicians and all the business. They're all ones who are uptight. The scientists actually are the ones who are loose and flowy and just kind of sure. seeing what's going on. Sure. Although there are uptight people everywhere. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess so. But <laughs> I'm trying to break, I'm trying to help break it down for you. A little bit. Yeah. Like, no, like scientists are also they're very open. They're very open. They're like artists and they're like poets when it comes there right down go. to it. Yeah, that's a that's they're, a very good. They're analogy. creating. They're creating. They are creating on a daily basis, on a minute to minute basis. Yeah. They have to be open. And it must be really interesting when you do discover something. It is anything, whether it's big, small, whatever, in between. Yeah. When you're working on something and you actually hit it, yeah. it just must be the most amazing feeling on sure. earth. Yeah, you're on a high for several days. God, At least. That's me to say. It's, it's, yeah. Because it's, science, I mean, science is... It's it's kind of tangible, but kind of isn't. Or how do you, how do you feel about that? I, mean, I, was trying, I was reading the books like, well, I guess is science tangible? Is it or not really? Well, or it kind of is. It's, it's it is and it isn't. It's difficult to define it. Yeah. It's difficult to grasp it. It it works. I mean, it's it's the, it's the best method we've discovered for discovering what the universe is like, right. what life is like, what the the Earth is like, mm -hmm. what what things are like. It's the best mm. method, but trying to define it has been an el elusive quest. Yeah. I mean, this is the it's, it's a subject called the philosophy of science. Yeah. No, any number of people have tried to encapsulate it. It's like saying to someone, what is jazz music? You can't put oh, that right, into you words. Yeah, you can't, that's you know, true. When you hear it, you know it's jazz. Yeah, that's very true, that's but, very but true. But trying to actually explain what it is, is uh, or encapsulate what it is, is, is almost impossible. This gentleman over here also is a, uh, a blues guitarist. Ah, uh, yeah, I love the blues. So, I mean, so does, does music, is, is, is there a science to music? Is there a science to music? Is there a music to science? <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, answer. yes, yeah. and yes. I know, I know it's yes, but I like, yes. I like that. I like that answer. Um, and does, does, that, does that actually has that helped you in your in your field? Do, knowing music, I always say arts are very important to our art society. Also. I think so. Does it, has it helped you with math and I th science? I right? think so. I, yeah. I, I think the two go hand in hand. Mm. Um, I agree. I think people who do good science or who think about science are often people who are creative in other fields. Einstein played the violin. I'm That's not trying to compare song. myself with Einstein right now. But <laughs> incidentally, have you seen the new Einstein? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I was going to say that. It was. Yet. It's excellent. I heard it's really Except, good. Except, by the way, the, the fact that they're talking about genius there you know. is is kind of odd because it it does promote the cult of the genius. But it, interestingly, but they're mentioning sex too, which is kind of funny. They said sure. Einstein is then like sure. it's like this whole kind of thing. So I'm, I'm very, Actually, I want to see it. I'm very curious to see it. Oh, I saw the first episode the other okay. day. It's fabulous. It's it's got Emily Watson, one of my favorite oh, actresses. Good. It's it's got the and him. The what's his name? The Australian his name guy. Now. He's really good, yeah. of course, in everything. Yeah. So yes, I, I do want to see it though. But um, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting that they're they're talking about all these different things about. Related to Einstein is going to be shown on the show. And they're like, oh my God, we never associated this with Einstein, this yeah. with Einstein. And your book comes, it's all, it's all kind of coming together. It, like, interesting that the guy who wrote the book that yes. it's based on, his name is Isaacson. He says right up front in the book, he says, one of the things about Einstein is because he was such a hero and a cult hero and regarded as a genius, this has had a, de a detrimental effect on science education. Because mm. in science education, you know, the average kid doesn't want to be compared with the genius. Oh, that's true. And this that's is true. this is yes. one of the another aspect of all of this. Yes. That to encourage students. I mean, I teach large classes, three hundred and fifty students at a time at UCLA. Wow. We want to give them the feeling, the confidence that they can contribute to the general effort. They don't have to be that alleged Got genius it. in order to Got do it. it. So, so there are many many aspects of all of this. But I thought it was interesting that the man who wrote the book that the series was based yeah. on actually distances himself from the idea of genius. But see, now, see, it's all coming right now. It's all coming together for me right now. Just talking to you, having read this book, hearing you just said about him, it's like, 
that's that's the perception I think I've had too about science. Even though I enjoy science, so I always feel like it's it's for those people over there. It's for that person up there. It's yeah. like it's not. It's, it, it is for all of us. It's for all of us. Yeah. This yeah. just depends. Just depends on how far you go and, into it or not. Yeah, yeah, and, and let me add a, a bit to that. It, science is, in a sense, non-negotiable. We can't pick and choose which bits we like about it. You know, when a, when a person gets on an airplane, they are, in a sense, trusting that the laws of aerodynamics have been figured out for the yes. last 200 years yes. and that you're going to be okay. Or when you go to the doctor when there's something wrong or when you take on the latest uh, exercise regimen or whatever, yeah. there, there's some... And, and what, what irks me and a lot of other people is that some of those people want to pick and choose they will deny certain parts of science and yet they implicitly accept other parts of science such as getting on an airplane they don't yeah. question that they don't question the use of their computer which is based on yeah. science so that, that that seems to me an, an odd situation i think it's xanax when you're on a plane <laughs> you do <laughs> i don't like flying but i fly so much i mean i've flown i've flown so much over right. since i mean for the last like 40 years or whatever right. Um, but I, but you know, I know, I know the science of it is that the plane will stay in the air usually, right. or whatever. It's just something that's it's one of my one of my fears. I do not like flying. I'm not afraid of crashing. Yeah, it's not. It's, I hate turbulence. Sure, don't we all? <laughs> I know. Like, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I know the most time the planes are going to stay in the. Air, I know that. I've had some really bad flights, but I've survived them. But I used to take a Xanax before I got on a plane. Maybe yeah. a shot of Maker's Mark. Okay, you know, I'll like, try that. I think I'll try that. <laughs> but that's the question I always want to ask a science denier. You know, do you, do you get on an airplane and, and, and right. do you think that do you realize that you're relying on on science? Yeah. What do you think it is? Like, what do you think? What do you think it is that's keeping this plane in the air? Yeah. yeah. Like, what is your reasoning with why it's just, yeah. just and you do it all the time? It's like. I won't say names who deny science. I won't say the names on here. Um, now, with, the, with some of these scientists, I really felt for them because they were really the way you portrayed them, how you talked about what they were, what they, who they were, and what they were going through. And and some of them are trying to disprove. I guess there's a, a physicist named Neil Bohr. Right. Niels Bohr. Right. We talk about him a lot in the book too. Sure. Actually, explain who Niels Bohr is first. Well, he's one of the uh, founders of atomic physics, of quantum theory, yeah. and had the Bohr model of the uh, electrons in shells. Now, a lot of my little people, yes. in quotes, are actually contributing li little pieces of information that Bohr built upon. For instance, there's a man called Nicholson. The book opens yes. with this guy, Nicholson. Yes. The interesting thing about Nicholson is he was, he was wrong about almost everything he did, <laughs> yeah. which brings up another point, right. which is that often there's no right and wrong in science. Yeah? Mm -hmm. There's only right and wrong in doing science exercises in school when you yeah. either get it right or wrong. You're right. But in, in science, it's just attempts. It's just... You know, you posit something, and then you experiment, and then you, in a sense, all of science is wrong, because all past theories have been now shown to be incorrect, yes, yes. and so it's just an evolutionary process. It, it, it's meaningless to talk about right and wrong in science. Yeah. So this guy Nicholson was wrong about almost everything, and yeah. yet it contributed to the developments of this hero of science, Niels Bohr. That I find remarkable. <laughs> well, I love reading your book. What one thing that I came out of this is there is this thing as failure. I don't think there's. I don't, I don't right. think there's such thing as failure. Right. It's like, I, mean, I think it's just it's just things didn't work, but they still led to something else. Right. That's kind of the right. sense I got out of the book. It's like That's there's right. not there's not really any failure in the book. Right. I mean, you talk about their you talk about their failures, right. but like there really isn't. Right. They just kind of. I mean, just that it was that was not right, and this is now disproven or that right. at the time it was what we thought it was at the time. Right. But now right. we know the new time it's this, and the That's new right. time it's this. So right. it's all provisional. Yeah. I, I was like, there's no such thing as failure. And actually, actually, getting that feeling out of this book actually helped me in something else I'm working on What's myself. That? that just, it just kind of was like, there is no failure really out right. there in anything. When you think right. about it, right. it's just, it's all trial. It's all trial and error, or just trial. Right. I don't even want to say error. It's just, it's all just trying stuff. Right. So right. you get something that actually clicks and it works. Right. Right. And and deep down, this is all evolution. This yep. is all, you know, this is all the the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, just performing experiments this yeah. works this doesn't let's move on to something else there's no, there's no more to yeah. it than that i know it's easy of all these seven people was there one or two of them that you felt really a kinship for because you're, you're telling the story a little bit did you feel like did you feel, did you feel connected to all of them or i mean how did, did you feel they're like they're um, like your kids so to speak like, sure <laughs> sure yeah, yeah. I, I lived with them for, for a couple yeah. of years as i was writing the book yeah well i like them all in, in their own special way <laughs> And there's one guy who's interesting. You mentioned him, Jeanne, a French, a French engineer. Yes. Um, he was what you might call a complete amateur. He wasn't a, he wasn't a, a professional scientist mm -hmm. in any field. And yet he 
made suggestions that to this day are being debated. He has a, an alternative version of the periodic table, which is very, That's very yes. interesting, very suggestive, yeah. and that experts in quantum mechanics are now taking an interest in. So he would be one of, one of the favorites. Well, you also, that leads into the periodic table because you did do a book called The Periodic Table, A Very Short Introduction. Right. So let's talk about that because growing up, you know, we're thinking we learned those, 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 those elements and, yeah. you know, the numbers and all, and H2O, and oh, yeah, it's so funny. Sure. But there's something obviously way behind it. I had no clue. I'm, I, I want to read that book now too. But I mean, it's like I don't know anything about that. Well, the periodic table is a central organizing principle in in chemistry, and in, it's one of the icons of mm -hmm. science. It, it's become a cultural icon. You now get T-shirts, mugs, <laughs> you know, sweatshirts, yes. you name it, yes. with the periodic table. <laughs> yes. But in science, it is absolutely key. It's one of the cornerstones. And I've, I've spent a lot of time understanding where this came from, its history, its significance, wow. how it connects with quantum mechanics, the governing theory mm -hmm. of all matter I in current day physics. Yeah, I, do. I want to talk about that because that, to me, it's like I said, it's iconic, but I'm sure that, I mean, how we got to each of those things must be a very interesting story. Sure. And by the way, it, it too is evolving all the time. It is not separate. Oh, so it is. People think that, you know, there it is up on the wall and it's just occasionally you glance at it for some piece of information. <laughs> yes. Well, yes and no. I mean, it is useful. Oh, wow. But at the same time, it, it's changing. So uh, it is. I'm on a committee that. right now that is debating the contents of one particular group of the periodic table, whether it should be those particular four elements or those. And so that's up for grabs. We're making wow. recommendations and hopefully... Well, yeah. A decision will be taken. Well, my thing is, so, I mean, so you guys, so you guys, you guys go over and go over, and then you, then you all vote and say, okay, yay, nay, it should be this, should be that. Well, yeah, something like that. Yeah? But we okay. we hammer it out. We look at the pros and cons. We we examine the issue. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really, oh, that's interesting too. Like that's, that's interesting. Um, you okay? So history, is, is, I found is your is your, is your first love. In a way, yeah. In some way, but yeah. you, but you love science. Obviously, you've been doing science for a long time sure. too, and you're, you're teaching. History it. was my first love. When yeah. I let me tell you a little story tell about me, that. Please when, tell when, me. when I was a little kid, about six years old, uh, I met an old kid. We were, we were visiting, and the, the older kid said to me, "Well, I am starting history in school next year." I said, "Oh, that sounds interesting. Can you tell me about it?" He said, mm, "Well, you're a bit too young. I, I don't think I can explain it to you. You wouldn't understand anyway." And from that day. I think my interest was piqued in this mm -hmm. mysterious, yes. subversive almost <laughs> subject yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. was, you know, that I wasn't old enough to yes. even tell. And, yeah. so, and, and pretty much in high school, it was one of my favorite subjects. I my loved team. history. Mm -hmm. I just, and, and even now when I try and understand a new science subject, a new aspect of science, I always go to the history. I want to see the continuity. I want to see where it mm -hmm. came from. I want to see its roots. It adds to the picture. It, does. It, it it brings in the personalities. It shows the growth. It's 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 boring to just come in with the just the facts. Yeah, it's very like this. Like that. I like that. Um, oh, I also wanted to ask you: Were there other? Did you have to narrow it down to seven, or, or, or how were there yes, more? Yes, there, there like a there lot are more? countless others yeah. that I could have put in. Yeah. So how did you pick these these seven? They pick themselves in a I way. Like they they okay. pick themselves. They're they're all to do with um, the structure of the atom, okay. how we think about the structure of the atom, how we think about the periodic table. Yeah, they're all roughly speaking of the same period. This is the early uh, early twentieth century, yeah. and they they all influence the heroes, so called. So I think so. Okay, so so as you were doing the research, the names came to you obviously, and then they started coming up more, I guess, more and more, yeah. and then that's how they kind of they, so they yeah. broke themselves. Yeah, I one of the things about reading the book too, I always think. I mean, I'm in the the 21st. Century. I'm here. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think back in the day when we didn't have all the things we have today. Yeah. How they find out stuff. Uh -huh. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. What tools they had back then. How much they knew back then. I mean, it's, and to me, it's fascinating. We know much more now. We have more sophisticated tools because of them. Um, we have them, but I think, wow, they're doing all this stuff back then without a computer. Sure. <laughs> without you know, well, our phones. Without, I mean, they do stuff that I'm like, wow, this is, this is amazing. Well, yeah. I mean, as we all know, the computer isn't everything. I mean, when I write, <laughs> yes. I, the first draft is always by hand. I, I don't know I why like I do that. it. I, I do it by hand, I do it with a pen, and I, I have a sense of more, a greater connection. I think the computer removes us slightly from the act of creating and writing. I like that. I write everything down. I'm a writer. Right. Well, actually, my notes, they're all handwritten. Right. I Because I, to me, you, said, you just said something that I always believe. When I write it down, yeah. I'm fully present, I'm in, right. and I'm committed. Right. 
on a computer, I can walk away and do something else. Right. I can stop at any time and just go, you know, I'll get right to it later. And maybe it even slows us down just a little yeah. bit to be able to really get in there. Yes, and make sure it's correct. To make a musical analogy, it's a little bit like the difference between playing an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar. Now, I love electric guitar. Yeah. But at the same time, there's something about the acoustic guitar. There's an immediacy about it yes. that you don't get with an electric guitar. That's true. How many guitars do you have? Oh, 10 or 12. Oh it depends oh on... Oh my <laughs> and what, what is your favorite guitar? Do you have one that's your favorite? You go to? I have a, a red Parker Fly. Oh, okay. Slightly unusual guitar, maybe, but yeah. I, I love it. It's light, wow. it's fast, it's... It's the blues. It's the blues. Oh my God! <laughs> one day you may hear you may hear an album from us. One day, who knows? Right? We're talking about off camera. <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm singing. He does blues. I mean, who knows? With that, right? with that voice of yours, <laughs> you would make a great blues singer. I, you know, I should try it. I should totally try it. I've just never done it before. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a doer. I try anything mostly. I'm Good. just like, sure, let's do it. Good. That's life. Um, that's the science of me. And that's why I should just try everything. Um, so people, like I said, people should read this book because people should really see what's going on back in the day when it comes to how we are today. Because like I said, there are things that we just take for granted mm -hmm. um, that just nobody knows about unless you're in the science field, you don't really know about. This is something that's very, I think it's very interesting that people should, I mean, there's stories about people in here. I mean, it's like, it's, it's a real live people. Sure, yeah. And now that hearing your thing about how you want to break it down so that everybody can see that everyone's just kind of doing their thing, I, it makes it even more fascinating yeah. to me. The, the very germ of the idea for the book was I was sitting in a lecture and a physicist, a historian of physics, was talking about Nicholson, the, the man I yeah. opened the book with, and he was saying that Nicholson had been spectacularly successful and then later it turned out almost everything he said was wrong. <laughs> so I, I set out to answer that question. How can that yeah. be? How can someone be right. wrong on almost everything yeah. and yet it can be successful? Yeah. And, and like I said, it goes back to there is no failure. It's just, it's just that that was his life path, and, and he yeah. did things, and he was a scientist, but just it right. turned out that some of the things just weren't. Yeah. And again, coming back to the evolutionary analogy, you know, when, when a, an animal over generations develops a new limb, say. Yes. Okay, now, yes. we wouldn't say that was right or wrong. We would right. say it either it confers a benefit to the animal or it doesn't. And if mm. it doesn't, that animal will get weeded out. If it does, That's that true. will propagate, it will pass it on to its offspring and yeah. so on. So there's no right and wrong in biology. Why should there be a right and wrong That's true. in science? You do, you're right, because we do, when we look at biology a lot of times, we'll say, oh, they developed that extra wing because, oh, that's because they must right. need it for this now. Right. And, you're like, and we, take, we take it for granted, yeah. okay, yeah. that's fine. But yeah, in science, we, yeah. we question everything. Yeah. Yeah. And there is no purpose in bio biological evolution. It just, it's just happening. Right. You know, we're not heading for an omega <laughs> point of perfection or, or something like that. There's no such thing as perfection, right? No perfection. There's no perfection at all, right? No. It's, it's oh. just life, the perfection. <laughs> I always say there's no perfection. Um, oh, I, and I forgot to mention one other person. Of course, I used to feel bad because I'm, I'm part Dutch. Anton. Van den Broek. I'm like, he's Dutch. I love my friends from Amazon. Right. Hello. Like, how, to forget yeah. about them, how to forget about him? Uh, talk about him for a little bit. Well, he was an economist. Yes. Yeah. No, tr no formal training <laughs> in science. I like that. It was like economist. Like and then right. he beat all the experts in, in one particular thing, atomic number, which is the way you identify elements. That's All the physicists were, were homing in on just very, very specific details. He took the broader picture. He looked at the periodic table. He looked at how the elements are all connected together. And he came up with this proposal, which ended up being yeah. the received view to this day. He's, which he, is interesting, yeah. the broader version. Like, see, I like that too. Sometimes it takes someone who's not in it right. so heavily in the eye of the storm or whatever right. they in it, yeah. who's on the outside a little bit can see something. Right. Right. A lot of people say that about Einstein. He was okay. tucked away in the patent office in Bern, Switzerland. <laughs> you know, he did not have a, a full-time academic job. And, and from that perspective, he was able to come up with these extraordinary theories yeah. that he did. It's funny that Einstein, I mean, he really is an iconic name, sure. figure. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I see you're talking to you. I, mean, I haven't talked to anybody else in science in a long time. I mean, it really is an iconic name. Like, it's, yeah. he, I mean, I see people out there, I was kind of hanging out and that kind of stuff. They always do little fun little yeah. memes and things like, he really is somebody who's, when you think science, you do think about him yeah. almost naturally first. Yeah, he's the best known scientist of the whole 20th century, if, uh, if not, you know, the modern age. And if anyone was ever a genius, a singular genius, that would be, that would be it. What well, about Sir Isaac Newton? Where does he fit in all that? Another genius. Yeah, another genius. Another, another <laughs> and, yet, and yet, as he himself said, you know, he stood on the shoulders of giants, mm. right? He, he, the discoveries he made were because of the little people. And if, uh, if nothing else, the little people are arguing with the heroes and forcing okay. them to refine what they're saying and to 
move forward. If they did, yeah. if you didn't have the little people prodding the big people, if we must speak in terms of big and yeah, little, yeah, 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 I, I, I like that. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's it's a dynamism. It's an interaction. It's it's not one person, an island, just spouting forth knowledge. Uh, they, we, n no man is an island. No scientist is an island. We're all working true. in a context. That's very true, and I, and I think and that's good in anything, of course. But yeah. in this in this context, exactly. And uh, like I said, when I, when I was reading when I was reading the book, and I was thinking, wow. There, there probably are other people just like these seven that are out there too that will still not get known. I mean, unless you wrote eight hundred books on every seven, you know, people you. I mean, little people. It's just so there's just so many out there right. that were trudging along and love science or right. whatever they were doing or love what part of science they were working on, and just it just I mean, nothing about anybody out there now who's like the little people today. Yeah. Or just like kind of like I said, I mean, I made a joke about you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson being the hunk now, the kind of the science hunk, but there are other men just like him and women just like him out there who probably have the same knowledge, but they just don't get the TV time. Yeah. And they're out there, or the radio time, and it's like they're out there, you know, doing the same kind of yeah. work. Yeah. It's like, it's, I guess, I guess nowadays it's just luck and chance how you get, how you get, how you get famous. I suppose so. I guess. Well, if you can tell me more about how to do that, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I'll come back and talk to you some more. I'm a little famous of you. I'm sure. I, know, I, know, I know a few people. Um, uh, may I just uh, inject another little piece in this? Please, please. One of, the, um, one of the things I wanted to do in this book, which I hadn't done before, okay. was to somehow bring together another strand in my thinking, which I've almost deliberately kept quiet about. Okay. And that's a more spiritual dimension. Yes, you do mention that in there, okay. yes. I mentioned that I'm interested in unity and that I've always been interested in Eastern philosophies yes. because Eastern philosophies concentrate especially yes. or so it would seem on the unity of everything yes you know there's this line from the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita that says I am that thou art that all this is that which is basically saying it's all one I mean it may sound yes. trite but oh no I think it's true that I'm trying to say that about science but I'm also trying to connect that with the view that everything is one there's a oneness I was going to mention Eastern because I believe in some Eastern philosophy too and I was listening to uh, some stuff the other day and there's one line that was in a in a, in a, a, a chant I was hearing and it's you know uh, I, if I love you I love myself right. if I love myself I love you and, right. and they say it over and over again I'm like and you know, everybody gets all like oh that's cheesy like it really is the, it's the truth yeah again going back to the unity and all it's like and then it, and taking it with science it's like it's it's all us right it's not just you doing it. Okay. What you're doing, the ripple effect affects me, right. and that affects my daughter and right. my grandkids and my cousins right. and your cousins. And it's like it's not just one thing. Okay, and of course there's a paradox because there's unity and there's diversity. Yes, that's, there is. That's the thing that keeps it all going. <laughs> now, how do you, how are you with? Because you do talk about it in the book and stuff. How's it how's it happened for you with other scientists when you mention? Eastern philosophy um, and... I don't mention it. Or spirituality. Up, up to now, I've so tended not to Okay, so now you have it in the book. Anybody saying anything else? Now I'm thinking, well, come on, you know, let's, <laughs> let's try and unify the different yes. strands of my own thinking, my own life. Why do you think you haven't mentioned it for the longest time, and, and why now? Do you, because do you because it's, it's generally not done. A scientist is not supposed to have right. views of this kind. You're supposed to leave all that out, because mm -hmm. if, if you betray those kind of views, you'll be regarded by some other people as, oh, he said that because he holds that view. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, you know, we're supposed to be completely objective and not to have any, shall we say, beliefs. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not talking about a belief in a, in a sense. Yeah. But you're human. You guys are humans. Yes, but the humanity tends to be left out of science. We, and, and this comes back to the idea of the, that scares people about scientists. Yeah. We're, we're almost supposed to be uh, robotic. robots, yeah. robotic, right? Who don't have likes and dislikes and, and subjectivity. We're supposed to be all about the objective. Interesting. And so it's part and parcel of that to deny yeah. one's, one's feelings. Well, yeah, that's, you're right. But then, okay, so then my question to you is that you... Now is it because you're in a place in your life you feel like you can you can handle now this re releasing your spirituality mixed with your science? Yes, you, I'm, okay. be, I'm be just beginning to, okay. and I'm and I'm looking forward to sort of opening up that uh, that dimension. Yeah, yeah. I, I always feel like when we when we get a little older, as as my birthday comes, I get a little more reflective. There are things I care less about now. Yeah. People think, and I'm more like I want to impart these things in the world yeah because that's what we're supposed to do right we're supposed to sure. give the energy out into the world sure. and i feel like that's from you you're saying okay now i can talk about this now it's okay if someone says well he's saying it because you, you'll be able to handle it now like, yeah. you're like 
that you know your true reasons or why you're saying stuff. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Right. And, everybody I, else does. and you know, in in all in all modesty, I've you know, I think I've written enough. I think I've established my credentials enough mm -hmm. to be able to risk in this way. That makes sense. That makes sense. It was your first book that now would be everybody just like, oh my god, who's this guy? But you've yeah. been around for and you teach, and I mean, you have all kind of stuff going on. So I mean, you are and you've been in the field for a while, and you're always at UCLA. I mean, that's a a very a very good school. <laughs> it's a little small school in Brentwood, but a yeah, small so. little school <laughs> with forty thousand students. Right. And, Oh my God, I love UCLA anyway. I love UCLA. I see how who's gone there, or alumni. Um, but no, I mean, so, and, so okay, actually, I want to ask you a little bit. Okay, so when the book came out, uh, have your students bought, you know, if your students have bought it? Some of them, something, yeah. Something? Some okay. of them, just occasionally, I'll, if somebody answers, answers a difficult question, I'll pull out a copy of the book and I'll <laughs> award it to them. <laughs> I love it. But you say you have classes of like 250 sometimes? 350. So you're like in a stadium seating. It's a bit of. of a performance. You have to wow. you have to draw their attention, especially as it's sometimes introductory classes where the students don't necessarily want to be there. Oh right. So there's more need to excite them about science, wow. in addition to imparting the the nitty gritty, the facts. Yeah, the, right. But I, I feel a you know a need to to make them excited about science, and I love doing it. I absolutely yeah. love doing it. Okay, so how long did it take you to write the book? Say about a couple of years. You couple were with of years it. or so, yeah. Uh, when you when you were finished, yeah. when you sent it in, yeah. when the la the, the last editor said it's fine, it's yeah. good, yeah. good to go, um, and then you get then you got it, this book in your hot little hands yeah. the first time. How did it feel? It, it feels great, but of course you're never finished because the the moment it's published, somebody sends you an email <laughs> saying, "By the way, you have three typos on such and such a page, and you didn't consider this, you didn't consider." Yes. But but of course it's a great feeling. Yes, and you said this book was a, a little bit of a departure for you. Yeah. So I was just wondering how did really so you thought you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish with this book? Yeah, yeah, for I'm the most part. Yeah, yeah, I'm still waiting to see what the reviewers are going to make of it yeah. and, and so on, but. <laughs> the process is great. It's nice to be invited to places to speak about it, like yourself. Like here, yes. Yeah. I, I've written two books and they're out there and I and I know how it is to have things go out there and you're just like, okay, well what's what's gonna happen? What's now? gonna happen? It's like yeah. now it's out there. You have to be well and, and then it's, this goes for a science but you you have to be really vulnerable yeah. on some level because especially with science, as you just said, in our climate today, people just fight each other like crabs in the barrel, just fight each other with science. You're putting something out that you feel is your truth at this at this mm -hmm. stage. Um, this is what you researched, you yeah. know, all this hard work yeah. that you found, and you really want to showcase these people, and you want to show these little people some love, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. And now it's out there for everybody to interpret however they want to, yeah. right? And, and I want to show people that science is fun, it's accessible, it's, it's much more of a humble enterprise than you've been led to believe. So you say you have a book. Do you have another book coming out soon too? You said or another book coming? Uh, yes, there's one coming out. Yeah. Is it something totally different than this? It's still on the aspects of the periodic okay. table. Okay. Yeah. So you so basically you write what you're feeling at the time. You kind of you kind of go with that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense there. Um, what was the last thing things I want to ask you here? Uh, actually, so wait, do you have curriculum at UCLA that you put together yourself, or is it curriculum that's already? It's a fairly standard curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. And how is that with you in terms of your own researching and books? That's what I want to ask you. How does it work with your own stuff? Well, it means I'm very busy a lot of the time. <laughs> we make sure everything kind of adds up and you can talk about it. And, yeah. yeah. You know. Have you ever crossed, run across anything you're like, I, I don't believe this at all in your classes? In my classes? Yeah. Well, no, because that's pretty solid information that we're imparting to, to okay. undergraduates. That's reliable material. Um, no, I don't think I would disagree with any of the standard curriculum. Also, in the book, one thing I wanted, I wanted to talk about, uh, what did I spell his name wrong? Thomas Kuhn? Kuhn? Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn. Right. Uh, talk about him a little bit. Thomas Kuhn is a historian and philosopher of science, American, who became really very famous yeah. um, because he had this view of scientific revolutions. He was saying that, and he contributed to the view of the importance of heroes in science, because if you have a revolution, it's because one or two people have oh, revolutionized right. the science. Yes. So the, a lot of the book is arguing against that. View, yes. Saying that science is a gradual evolution rather than a, a revolution. revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found that interesting too with him. So I was like, I wonder what he would say if he saw this. <laughs> I, hmm? I, I, wonder, I wonder what, he, I wonder what, they, would, what they would I would say. love to think that he would enjoy debating with me. Ooh, I'm looking at both my show. I'll sit in the middle, both on each side. 
That'd be I, good. Unfortunately, he's no longer with yeah, us. Yeah. But that's why, that's why I said I wonder what he would think. Yeah, I just wonder. Yeah. That's one thing too. I mean, I wonder what you know, what Neil's. I wonder what they would think if they read this book. Like, like, oh, okay. Would they be proud? Would they be angry? Would they be like? You know, I, mean, I have the, most of the scientists and uh, historians and philosophers I've spoken to have said, okay. yes, of course. This, in a way, this is quite obvious. Uh, so I have this this funny feeling that I'm saying something that's completely obvious, and yet because I'm highlighting it and documenting it, I think I'm still saying something that's original. So once again, it's paradoxical. It's mundane. It's obvious. But sometimes uh, the really good ideas are like that. You know, they say that yes. what philosophers do is they, they, they notice something that's there and obvious and that nobody else is focused on. I'd like to think, you know, I'd like to think that I, that's what I'm doing here. I like that. That's it. But that's, I mean, it's a lot, a lot of different professions. Like there people who are really good sometimes find the obvious and bring it out to everybody. Right. And no one's talking about it, but it's, it's obvious. Yeah. It's like we can't discount what's obvious sometimes right, right in front of us. Right. At least, at least we talked about. And then when other people see it, they think, well, it's so obvious. Why right. didn't I think of right, it? Right, exactly. And, I say sometimes. When someone invents something, I'm like, why didn't I invent that? I mean, of course. Oh, my God. We totally need that. And I think of sometimes when I see stuff like that. But I'm not an inventor. So people, people do that. They're, they're inventors. I, I talk on TV and radio. Like that. It's a great book. Thank you. I mean, I mean I, I just, I'm just talking to you. I'm more, I'm more excited. Because I just I think I like your philosophy about how we're all one and how science is all one. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a person who comes from like I call the village mentality. Uh -huh. You know, I have ancestors who came from villages who you work together. Right. The elders and the young people and everybody in between. Everybody works together to help the village. Right. And I feel like we're, and, you know, I always say think, you know, globally. I, I, I totally believe that. Mm -hmm. And your book and you are just like, you're a part of that. And I love it. Um, do you, um, is there any difference between Americans in science and Europeans in science? Oh, that's a tough one. Let's see. American science tends to be more pragmatic. It tends to be more hardworking in the sense of, um, for instance, in education, one does more and more exercises. Okay. I think in Europe, there's there's a, t a tendency to think about things a little bit more. Uh, for instance, we have the system at Oxford and Cambridge where you go into a little room with a tutor and you just discuss. You just discuss. Oh, wow. There doesn't have to be a, a definite ending or conclusion. That Perhaps I mean I'm slightly biased there, yeah, having yeah, grown no. up in that system. Yeah. I think, but that you're here also too. You've done. I've, I've been here 22 yeah. years now, so you're you're American. I'm sorry. I have a dual passport. So, See, okay, so I, I knew it. Yes, I to, yes. But but if if any if any difference exists, I th I think um, perhaps there's more time for philosophy in in Europe. Okay. And I mean, the French invented philosophy, yes. for example, yeah. right? Uh, if French have philosophy in high school. We don't have philosophy yeah, in high school. In Britain, we didn't have philosophy in high school. I didn't really know much about philosophy. Um, uh, America is a more pragmatic country in general. You know, you, the ideas are developed in a, in a muscular sort of way. I like right? that's, that's a good analogy. My Uncle Tommy, uh, Dr. Lott, he's a professor of philosophy at a San Jose State. Is that right? So speaking of philosophy, ah. yeah. So I'm like, you're right, but we don't we don't learn that in high school. You're absolutely correct. And there's so much talk these days about the American education system being, you know, lagging behind. Yes. That I think it could do with a little bit more of yes. history and philosophy and yes. and creativity. You know, well, we, have to, we have to decide our history first before we can teach it. <clears throat> seems like in America, we have a little we have a little stuff going on there when it comes to history. It seems like my uh, my grandkids go to arts based schools. Uh -huh. They call, they call it Leonardo da Vinci schools, and they go there and right. they learn. They have art programs, that are just as important as the wonderful. That's right, especially academics. But yeah, I know history for me. I learned more history in college than I did in high school. What's your interest in history? How did that? How did that come about? Um, I love. Started with my family first hmm. as a kid. Yeah, learning. I have a very di come from a diverse family. I come from Dutch. Yeah. I come from the Caribbean. Yeah. I come from Creole in Louisiana. Okay. I mean, I come from this huge, and, I, and so I started fascinated about. Where did we come from? And right. this person came from a boat, and this one came over here, and this was slavery here, and this was—I mean, just I just I got into that, and then I had a teacher, uh, Miss Hughes, uh, and when I was in elementary school, who really made his, history seem really exciting, right. American history, and I found and I, and I learned early on that if we, if they say this all the time, if you don't learn history, you're doing to repeat it. It just made sense to me to learn what happened. It made things at the time make sense presently. Yeah. And I grew up in the 70s and 80s, and it was like there was a lot of stuff that happened then. Learning the history made it more sense for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, I said, and ever since then, any subject that I ever get into, I love the history behind it. Yeah. So I can get, it just helps me 
feel more well rounded. Mm-hmm. I know what's what's going. That's a very good question. You should do my job. It's a very good question. I never really thought about it before. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's uh, it just makes you feel more well rounded presently. Yeah. Um, in anything that I do, if I know the history of it. Yeah. And and quite apart from anything else, the history is all that we have left at the end of it. Yes. <laughs> Well, we're in true. the present. We're moving ahead relentlessly. Yeah. The history is there. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I carry the history with me. I always say I carry my ancestors with me. I mean, it's not they're 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 on my shoulders. They're behind me. All their stuff has led to me yeah. sitting here across from yeah. you, talking to you on a, on a TV, on a, on a studio. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's all. I mean, that's on, on some level that's that. But on larger levels, there there are developments that we're on. You know, we're on the internet or this. We have headphones. I mean, all this stuff. It's all history. Or as the Eastern philosophers might say, in order to move forward, you need to look backwards. Yes. You need to come from behind in order to move more effectively forward. And in, and in, in life coaching, we always say you have to come from center, which is also kind of an Eastern thing too. You have to get to center somehow before right. you can actually expand out right. and to make sure you know who you are. And to me, history is part of that. I mean, knowing is knowing who you are. You still do life coaching? I need a I life do, coach. I do, I, do life, I do life coaching. I do. All right. I actually, I have life, a lot of help is my life coaching. And I have a life coaching podcast, too. Um, but I, just, I, I feel history is just such... To me, it's, I don't have people who say they, they don't like history. Like, how do you not like history? Yeah. There's so many interesting larger stories, smaller stories, obscure stories... Yeah in every field and right. now I guess in science too but it's, they're everywhere right and you can understand the present so much better if you know where it yeah. came from yeah right. it explains it to me sometimes it, sometimes it gives you like Oprah says well, aha moments when I've read certain stories or read certain books yeah. like oh okay that's why yeah. that part of country feels that way right. or that's why right. women feel this way or right. that's why you, know, you, just, you just know it and it's partly what's wrong with the news isn't it when they, they tell you well okay there's a situation in North Korea but why is there that situation well, what led up to that? Right. You know, just tell us some of the background. Right. They Get, just don't. They don't. God, no, that's a lot. That's, that's why I like history. That's a very good question. I, I never really thought of it for a while, like history, but I've always liked it in college. I got A's in history. I, just, I love history. Hmm. I, I, like, I like research. I'm a researcher, too. I like to research things. But I just never got into science, science, or hmm. like, I just, I just, I, when it comes to other fields I do, I'm very, I'm good on researching and digging in. And getting in the trenches and finding and finding those little things that you don't read about or hear about. Like I like that right there, and I'll, yeah. I'll try to highlight that. So, yeah. especially with my guests, like the same thing. I have to do that. I love that. So when you said you were, and I saw, oh, it's a blues guitarist. I want to talk that for a second. I mean, that's a very interesting. I didn't expect to see that when I was. I'll come back and talk about the history of the blues sometimes. Oh, should should we do that? Oh, yes, you should. Maybe I should write a book on that. God, you, you should. Why not? It's, well, a lot of people have done it, so I'm going to have to find an angle. But, but I'm sure I'm saying I'm sure you have an angle mm-hmm. in there. That's the whole thing. Find the angle. If you don't see it, be it. They always say, if you don't see it, be it. So find the angle, find that niche part of it, and then you can probably tell a story. Yeah. And, and, and infuse it with your experience. Mm-hmm. So how have you probably been playing guitar for a while? How long have you been playing? Oh, a long since time. Since I was 15 years so old. So there you go. So you, then you must have some kind of angle. You must, I must got do. to jam with Ronnie Earl, the famous blues oh. guitarist. Wow. I had an article in Scientific American. His wife, who's a high school teacher <laughs> in Massachusetts, saw the article. She said, come and give a lecture at the school, and you get to do a jam session with Ronnie Earl, who happens to be my husband. I oh said, wow, God. best gig I've ever done. So you never know. Life is so wonderful. <laughs> you never know who's watching, who's reading, and where it can lead you. Yeah. I love that. I love stories like that. I love that. Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you. This is really, this is really thank great. Thank you. And you guys, the book, get it, get it, get it. It is called A Tale of Seven Scientists and a New Philosophy of Science. Eric Sherry, go out there and get it. Run there and get, tell me you got it. If you're a watcher, tell me you got it. Let me know. Um, and it's, helped it's, it's a really good book, you guys. You should read it. You're, so, it. you're too kind. It's, it's good. No, it's yeah. good. I don't, I don't tell lies in this show. I tell the truth. <laughs> We're not, that, not the kind of program. We tell the truth on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and you can follow him at ericsherry.com, of course. Um, and this book is everywhere. This book is on Amazon, everything, isn't it? It's on yeah, Amazon, yeah, yeah. Barnes & Noble, all, all the usual places. All the usual places. You can get, yeah. you get it there, of course. I'm sure you'll get that. And I'll post links on my page, too, so you can ask it. If Thank you, you, James. I'll, I'll do that. I'll Thank post you. links to it so you can get them and just make it, easy, make it all easy for you so no one can make an excuse. And I'm James Hutchinson here, of course. You can follow us on iTunes. You can follow us on YouTube under Books Look Online. I have about... Ten other interviews on there from that one. And then our sister network is After Buzz TV. I'm on like 20 shows there. You can follow me there. And then you can follow me at James Lott Jr. And also, like I said, I have my, my couple books I have out on Amazon, too. Just Google James Lott Jr. on Amazon. You can find them there, too. You should be reading. Reading is good. It's summertime coming up. You should be out there reading. And, and it helps keep your brain alive and learn some new stuff. Thank you for watching us. And next time, I will see you again. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, 
We would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. Every detail yeah. and, and, so, and making sure it's consistent and, and so on. But it was fun. I mean, I love doing it. Yeah. I've, I've done many books now. and uh, Yes, you've done, you done over, what, 10, 15? I've got about, I've got 10 books. And wow, that's good. An 11th one in the press. But this one was kind of special. This is a new departure for me. Um, as you mentioned, it's seven scientists. I call them the little people. The little people, yes. Let me tell you more about the little people. Yes, please. The little people are the unsung heroes. They're the ones who, even scientists have barely heard of these guys. Uh, they're the missing links. They show us that science is not about just the geniuses. You know, the public perception of science is that it's created by these people with individ outstanding individual abilities. And that, that results in a distorted image of what science is. It, it, it produces an image of science as an elitist activity practiced by the high priests, the <laughs> Einsteins, yes. the, the Richard Feynmans. Yeah. But actually, there are so many more people who are contributing. And that's why I got this book because it's not because again we're fed whatever we're you know whatever history tell whatever we're told right whatever right. it's written yeah. and whatever's celebrated. You said you give a good point about how these certain people they're the ones that are talked about. Yeah. But there's like there are a lot of folks out there who are all in this field right. and they're all working and they're all right. doing things. Right. Why do you think they, some of these people are just not? Well, why it, these seven people weren't like you know told talking about? It's the cult of genius. Uh, it's the cult of the personality, and that's partly responsible. You know, it, it feeds in a way, it uh, motivates scientists to want to be the best. Mm -hmm. but, but that leads to a distorted picture. I mean, yeah. it, uh, there's a fabric of science made up of, in fact, I mean, I go further in the book. I claim that science is, is one organic whole. It's an entity, it's a living entity, mm -hmm. a little bit like, you, you heard of the Gaia hypothesis mm -hmm. by James Lovelock? Yeah. He's, he claims the earth is a living organism. Yes. I'm saying science is a living mm -hmm. organism. I believe it. I totally believe it. You've got all these competing individuals. Mm -hmm. Of course, competition is good. I'm not trying to deny competition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. seen from afar, it's a bit yeah. like a beehive where all the bees mm. are collectively working for the good of the hive. Yeah. So all these priority disputes that scientists engage in, you know, they matter to the scientist. Mm. Uh, competition leads them to better things. Okay, yeah. But science as a whole sort of um, laughs at this masquerade <laughs> of the personality <laughs> cult and the competition yeah. because science marches on regardless. In fact, it benefits oh, yes. from that competition. You know, because yeah, because I'm thinking science doesn't care if you're popular or not. I mean, exactly. it's, it's all being, it's all the work that you do, the energy you put into it is right. what science is. And in, and it's the collective result of yeah. all these people contributing. Yes. So even if you're the loudest or wear the brightest clothes in science, you know, so, to speak, so to speak, it doesn't really matter in the long run. You might you might get noticed more. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. But yeah. it's like, the, but it doesn't really mean anything to right. actual science. Exactly. That, that makes sense to me. That's what, that totally makes sense to me. Um, when you mentioned, so you mentioned, you said, you, so when you use the little people, because I love that, because it's, it's such a nice, uh, it's a, there's a nice way of saying these are folks who, they're not really little people. It's, like, it's just right. kind of a, a use of a word, a term that we use sometimes yeah. Yeah. for the folks who don't get recognized. The little people of science, they're the heroes today. We're talking to Eric Sherry next. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Yes, and it's science today here at Book Circle Online. Yes, you get James and science. I like science, science is good, I should be a nurse. A long time ago, my other careers, a long time ago. I believe science is very important. It's in the news a lot these days, too. <laughs> so, other ways. Hi, welcome to Book Circle Online. I'm James Lodgini, your host. And she and he, they all blinded me with science. Thank you, Thomas Dolby. I love that. Okay, my guest today wrote this really fascinating book that I want you guys to all get. If you're, if you're a history fan, if you're a science fan, if you, you just want to know what's going on in the world, you should read this book. It's called A, Seven, a Tale of Seven Scientists and the New Philosophy of Science. Um, it's a little bit of history. It's a lot of science, a little bit of philosophy. Some things I'm sure people think are controversial in some ways. I found I just found it a very, very interesting read. I like the way it's set up. I love it. You should go out there and get it. My guest is Dr. Eric Sherry. How are you, sir? Good. 
Hi. Welcome. You? you have that great gray hair. I'm, I get it right here. I, I'm hoping, hoping the top turns well, that way at some you. point. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes, welcome. So you guys can follow us on iTunes and YouTube under Book Circle Online. We actually have a, a Twitter page, and it's Book Circle On. Mm -hmm. And you can follow me at James Law Jr. All over the universe, type my name in, and I will show up. Not at your house, but I will show up you know, on the Internet. And where can they find you on social media? Out there. I, a couple of websites. Yes. Uh, ericsherry.com, basically. Very good. Well, ericsherry.com, that's where you should go. Right. And, that's, and if you guys who are listening, that's Sherry as an S-C-E-R-R-I. Just make sure we have people who listen to the show. That's right. Make sure we get that out there. Uh, okay, so you, this book, very, very good book. Thank you. Um, one of the things I was telling you kind of off camera, I'm going to reiterate here on camera, that it's, you can tell your love of history. Mm -hmm. I know you like history. Sure. And so do I. So the book is really set, it's a, it's a really easy read, folks. So anybody out there who's thinking, oh my God, science, get that out the, out the door. It's a nice read. You talk about, I like the way each chapter is set up. Because mm -hmm. you're talking about these seven scientists who, I want to make sure I say their names because they're important today mm -hmm. and always. Edmund Stoner, John Nicholson, Richard Abegg, Abegg, right? yeah. Abegg. Uh -huh. uh, Charles Berry, John D. Mainsmith, mm -hmm. and uh, Charles Genet, right? Because ah. he's French, mm -hmm. right? Make sure I make that correctly. Um, and you talk about each of them a little bit, what they, who they are, yeah. and then what their, what, their, what their contributions were. And, and also you talk about some of the things they were actually trying to disprove. Mm -hmm. Um, and you and you tie in with your because you, you, it's also it's your book, so it's, it's from you mm -hmm. and you're talking too. How how easy or hard was it to write this book, this type of book? Well, uh, it was kind of easy because it's my passion. Mm -hmm. It was hard because I had to do the really hard work of chasing up like that. Yeah. Because if something comes along that is unexpected, you have to change direction. You have to follow that. Yeah. You, you cannot have expectations. And at the end of the day, nature decides. We ask the questions, and we get the answer back from nature. And, and if it fits, good. If it doesn't, you change direction. It has to be open. It has to be a constant dialogue yeah. with, with nature. Wow. That's very interesting. I, I never really thought of it that way. That's very, that's very interesting. So, you, so basically, you have to always be present and open to the universe as you're in science. Right. right. That's, that's there's, right. there's no dogmas. There's yeah. no rules in advance. There's you, it, it's precisely the opposite of you yeah. know a system of beliefs which is well defined in advance and that's yeah. why sometimes there's clashes between let's say religion and science because yes. you know in this respect the two systems are somehow opposed you know oh yes political systems yes. religious systems sometimes have a set of dogmas that they want yeah. to preserve or the constitution say it, yeah a lot of people want to preserve it as it is mm -hmm. that's the antithesis antithesis yes. of what science is which is that there is no dogma we're, right. up, we're revising things continually. We go, yes. we go with the flow. We go with what, yeah. what comes along next. So scientists aren't these like uptight people. It's like it's basically the politicians and all the business. They're all ones who are uptight. The scientists actually are the ones who are loose and flowy and just kind of sure. seeing what's going on. Sure. Although there are uptight people everywhere. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I guess so. But <laughs> I'm trying to break, I'm trying to help break it down for you. A little bit. Yeah. Like, like scientists are also they're very open. They're very open. They're like artists and they're like poets when it comes there right down go. to it. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very good analogy. They're creating. They're creating. They are creating. On a daily basis, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Yeah, they have to be open. And it must be really interesting when you do discover something. It is anything, whether it's big, small, whatever, in between. Yeah. When you're working on something and you actually hit it, yeah. it just must be the most amazing feeling on sure. earth. Yeah, you're on a high for several days. God, At least. <laughs> I just, I just, that's me to say. It's, it's, yeah, it's, cause science, I mean, cause science is... It's it's kind of tangible, but it kind of isn't. Or how do you how do you feel about that? I mean, I was trying, I was reading the books like, well, I guess is science tangible? Is it or not really? Well, or it kind of is. It's it's it is and it isn't. It's difficult to define it. Yeah. It's difficult to grasp it. It it works. I mean, it's it's the, it's the best method we've discovered for discovering what the universe is like, right. what life is like, what the the Earth is like, mm -hmm. what what things are like. It's the best mm. method, but trying to define it has been an el elusive quest. Yeah. I mean, this is the, it's, it's a subject called the philosophy of science. Yeah. No, any number of people have tried to encapsulate it. It's like saying to someone, what is jazz music? You can't put oh, that right, into you words. Yeah, you can't, that's you know, true. When you hear it, you know it's jazz. Yeah, it's very true, it's <laughs> very true. But trying to actually explain what it is, is uh, or encapsulate what it is, is, is almost impossible. This gentleman over here also is a, uh, a blues guitarist. Oh, yeah, I love the blues. So, I mean, so does does music, is, is there a science to music? 
is there a science to music? Is there a music to science? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's yes, that's yes, and yes. I know, I know it's yes, but I like, yes. I like that. I like that answer. Um, and is that, is that does that actually has that helped you in your in your field? Do, knowing music, I always say arts are very important to our, our society. Also. I think so. Does it has it helped you with math and I th- science? I and think it? so. I, yeah. I I think the two go hand in hand. Mm. Um, I agree. I think people who do good science or who think about science are often people who are creative in other fields. Einstein played the violin. I'm That's not trying to compare song. myself with Einstein right now. But <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, have you seen the new Einstein? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. I was going to say that. It was, yet. It's excellent. I heard it's really Except, good. Except, by the way, the, the fact that they're talking about genius there you know. is, is kind of odd because it, it does promote the cult of the genius. But it, interestingly... But they're mentioning sex too, which is kind of funny. They said sure, Einstein. Is like, sure. It's like this whole kind of thing. So I'm very, I'm very, Actually, I want to see it. I'm very curious to see it. Oh, I saw the first episode the other okay. day. It's fabulous. It's, it's got Emily Watson, one of my favorite oh, actresses. It's, it's got the... And him, the, what's his name? The Australian his name guy. Now. He's really good, yeah. of course, in everything. Yeah. So yes, I, I do want to see it though. But um, I, thought was, I thought it was interesting that they're, they're talking about all these different things about related to Einstein is going to be shown on the show and they're like oh my god we already associated this with Einstein this yeah. with Einstein and your book comes, it's all it's all kind of coming together it, like interesting that the guy who wrote the book that yes. it's based on his name is Isaacson he says right up front in the book he says one of the things about Einstein is because he was such a hero and a cult hero and mm-hmm. regarded as a genius this has had a, de- a detrimental effect on science education mm-hmm. because in science education you know the average kid doesn't want to be compared with the genius Oh, that's true. I mean, this that's is true. this is yes. one of the another aspect of all of this. Yes, that to encourage students. I mean, I teach large classes, three hundred and fifty students at a time at UCLA. Wow. We want to give them the feeling, the confidence that they can contribute to the general effort. They don't have to be that alleged Got genius it. in order to Got do it. it. So, so there are many many aspects of all of this. But I thought it was interesting that the man who wrote the book that the series was based yeah. on actually distances himself from the idea of genius. But see, now, see, it's all coming right now. It's all coming together for me right now. Just talking to you, having read this book, hearing you just said about him, it's like that's that's a perception I think I've had too about science. Even though I enjoy science, so I always feel like it's it's for those people over there. It's for that person up there. It's yeah. like it's not. It's, it, it is for all of us. It's for all of us. Yeah. This yeah. just, just depends on how far you go um, into it or not. Yeah, yeah. And let, and let me add a, a bit to that. It, science is, in a sense, non-negotiable. We can't okay. pick and choose which bits we like about it. You know, when a, like when that. a person gets on an airplane, they are, in a sense, trusting that the laws of aerodynamics have been figured out for the yes. last 200 years, yes. and that you're going to be okay. Or when you go to the doctor when there's something wrong, or when you take on the latest uh, exercise regimen or whatever, that yeah. there, there's some... And, and what, what irks me and a lot of other people is that some of those people p- want to pick and choose. They will deny certain parts of science, and yet they implicitly accept other parts of science, such as getting on an airplane. They don't yeah. question that. They don't question the use of their computer, which is based on yeah. science. So that, that that seems to me an, an odd situation. I think it's Xanax, like on a plane. <laughs> you do? <laughs> I don't like flying. But I fly so much. Yes, sure. sure. Thank you, people who step their ways, except on little people. Yeah. I like that term. And was there any reservation using that term at all? Or was that something you were like, I um, need to use this term? I use it uh, tongue in cheek. I'm saying that the little people are really just as big as the big people. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's what I'm implying here. And this book really does, I mean, it does, t- I mean, that's, that's the whole feeling on that. You are an author, you're a historian, philosopher of chemistry at UCLA? That's right. Right, that's, you, you are a smart person. <laughs> I've been around smart people, I love that. <laughs> um, so, and, the way, and this is why I bring that up is because science gets this kind of, like, people just like fall asleep and they hear the word science. Right. Except for Neil deGrasse Tyson now suddenly is a science hunk. All of a sudden sure. he's the science guy, sure. so to speak. And Bill Nye, of course, too. But, yeah. Um, but science is something that is actually exciting. Sure. Why aren't we more excited about it, you think, and just in your opinion? Uh, partly because it's seen as an elitist activity. Uh, so you're here to break it down for I'm people, trying. Right? I'm really tr- doing my best yeah. to try and break down that. And, and these days, even in the political sphere, it's become so important. Yes. I mean, scientists are classed as elitists, and therefore there's more likelihood of denying science, perhaps. <laughs> Which is unfortunately happening ref, how, left, right, and center. How do you feel about that? How can, how can people well, deny certain things? It's like it's science. Like how could, do you deny stuff? I could go on at great length <laughs> on that subject, and I'm sure we will as we get into this. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we get into this. I just, I just, it just, it just, because I have, I have you in front of me, so like this is crazy. It's crazy to me. I'm like, how people, you know. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So you're from Malta originally, correct? I'm from Malta, and you were raised in England. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 you're a person. You seems like when I was doing research on you, you're a challenger. But I see now as I'm talking to you. 
it's in the context of breaking it all down so that there's there's everyone's on the same kind of level mm. in science. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the way I kind of get from you. Uh-huh. So that we're all we're all doing stuff. Some people, yeah, some people are yeah. a little smarter yeah. than others. Some people have yeah. expertise in certain things, right. but seemingly it's you. You don't just take everything, take everything for face value. You want to know deeper. Is that right. correct? That's Absolutely. why the book is Absolutely. part of that. Yeah, that's it. I, I'm interested in philosophy. I'm interested in, in getting in the deeper picture of this. I'm interested in saying that it uh, science, contrary to the public image it generally has, is actually a very humble activity, just like any other activity. You know, we're just trying things out. We're stumbling around in the dark. The, you know, the, the rational, the powerful rational mind, the super intellect I- is a distortion of what's really going on. And that's why the little people are actually contributing because they stumble around just as much as the heroes stumble around. Mm-hmm. And the result of the stumbling, the serendipity, the failed attempts, somehow all conspires together to give us what we have as science. So it, it, it really is just a gradual evolutionary development. It's not, it's not by design, it's not planned out in advance. It doesn't have that sort of uni- unidirectional uh, path yeah. that one usually assumes about science. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's an evolution just like so much else in life is. That makes sense to me, because now, now you say that, I'm thinking about that, and as I read this book, I'm thinking, like, you're right, it's, it's more, uh, like, a certain certain professions, there is, like, a line or something, like, but science could go any direction, any, anywhere, could, any time, it doesn't really... And it, it helps that it's like...